The connection between taste, smell, and memory is a very curious one. Um, it's well documented. We've all had the experience. There are interesting, quirky things about it. Why there is such a connection or how it exactly works is not so well known. But, but we get hints from the nature of it. So we've all had the experience, of course, this so-called Proustian experience. You know, there's a famous passage in Marcel Proust's remembrance of things past in which he tastes a Madeleine cookie and a sip of lemon tea. And this vivid memory from 40 years earlier, from his childhood, 40 years earlier, coming home from church and having this lemon tea and a Madeleine cookie at his aunt's house, just comes back to him and perfectly vivid as if it were right there in front of him. And he writes several pages about that and then goes on to write, what, 40 volumes or some crazy thing about seven volumes, I think it actually is, of, of memory, of memory. So that's maybe the extreme example, but we've all had that experience where we smell something or we taste something and some memory quite vivid comes back, usually from quite some time ago. Now, one of the things we can note about those memories is they're always emotionally laden somehow or another. You don't smell something and remember a page of text or an equation or a phone number or something useful like that. You always remember something like grandma's living room, the first day of school, you know, one of the most, um, one of the most uh, recognizable smells in America is the smell of crayons, Crayola crayons. So, and I, you know, you, that brings right back, you can imagine that smell and you're back in school somehow or another. So it's always something emotional, your first lover or some event like that. So that's one important thing about it. It seems to have an emotional content uh, rather than an informational content, if you will, for these memories. The other is that they're, they're long-lasting. They, they, we recall things from many, many years ago, and they're extremely vivid. Now, the ones that involve taste, which I remind you again, also involve olfaction, really, um, we call them taste aversions because you have the sense that it's taste, that it's in your mouth. But this is just a trick, by the way, your brain is playing on you. If you've done the jelly bean experiment, you'll know that the flavor is due to your olfactory system, and yet the experience of flavor is unquestionably still in your mouth. This is just some little trick your brain plays on you because it, it thinks that's where it should taste things. So, so we call them taste aversions. These are very interesting, and we've all had this experience too. We eat some food, a few hours later we get sick from it, and that's it. We can't, just can't even think about eating it again. This is also a very, very interesting kind of learning, which is very uncommon. For one, it's one trial learning. You eat something, you get sick from it, you're done with it. It lasts for an extremely long time, typically years, sometimes the rest of your life. You just don't want anything to do with whatever it was that made you sick, peanut butter or lobster or whatever it was, you know. Um, and, and most remarkably, you can, this memory can be formed with several hours of delay, which is very uncommon. Usually in order to make, and this works for other animals as well, not just people, you can induce a taste aversion in a mouse or a rat or a dog or anything. like They get them normally, but you can also induce them. Um, and you can do it with hours of delay. So you can, you can taste the food, you can eat the food, and then you get sick on it four or five, six hours later, and that's the, you can have even eaten things in between that, and it doesn't matter. You'll, your aversion will be to what you tasted then that made you sick. Um, and as I say, that's true for other animals as well. So it's one trial learning, it's extremely long lasting, it's a very stable, intense memory, and it, uh, and it, it can um, be formed with significant delay in it. There's a great uh, instance of this, I have to say, a researcher named John Garcia, I believe is his name. Several years ago, um, he was, I forget where he was, but, but at some university in, I believe California, in any case in the West, and there was a problem with coyotes predating on, predating on, on sheep. So um, sheep farmers were up in arms. The coyotes were killing off their sheep, and they wanted to go out and shoot all the coyotes, which would have also been a bad idea because it's part of a whole ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. So Garcia came up with this idea that maybe he could get the coyotes to leave the sheep alone, and he did it by using taste aversion. So he took a few sheep carcasses, dead sheep, and he laced them with a chemical called lithium chloride. Now, if you eat something with lithium chloride in it, you will get dreadfully ill. You'll get terribly sick, miserable nausea and all the rest of that, but you will not die from it. And so these coyote would come and eat these sheep. 
Then they go back to their burrow and they would just spend a miserable night being sick from the sheep. And that was it. They just didn't want anything to do with sheep after that. And so you had these coyotes that just, you know, they'd find something else to eat. Whatever it was, I'll go kill something else, but I'm not messing with sheep anymore. So it was quite effective, actually.